Yes, please. This question will be a two-part question. I guess on the, on the lowest level, I'm asking why certain documents for patient values are zero, so that the normalized side fields are not being applied to a But I'm really asking, I feel the level is what is the in the circle of Grangian symmetries in the, un in the un normalized fields, within the vertical of Grangian, within the normalized fields, it's not obvious to me that there's the symmetries ought to be present in the normalized parameters. Well, if the renormalized parameters are just rescalings of the unrenormalized parameters, then it's obviously true. Okay, this is the case for the psi field. The psi field is just rescaled. How about right now, five, five. There is no, was no symmetry in the phi field to begin with. There was no symmetry under phi goes into minus phi. That's why the phi field could develop a vacuum expectation value. Okay, so if there's more than one phi field, though, there would be a symmetry present. So there, would there may or may not be. It depends. Okay, it simply depends on, I could put in 42 phi fields, but no particular relations between their masses and coupling constants, and then they might all get vacuum expectation values. Well, if they were all quadratic, you know, then it would be invariant under... Uh, yes, then it would be invariant under each phi going into minus itself. And zero. Yeah, vacuum expectation values. On the base of this, we are always assuming that the vacuum is unique. We are always assuming that there is a unique ground state. Okay, if there... <coughs> Later on in the second semester, we'll turn to the case of so-called spontaneous symmetry breakdown, which is analogous to um, certain phenomena associated with um, phase transitions in statistical mechanics. And we'll show there that we can construct theories where there is not a unique ground state, and therefore a field may develop a vacuum expectation value even though there is a asymmetry of Lagrangian. Can I rephrase this question? Yeah. No, I want to make sure I've answered everything you, you wanted to ask. If the Lagrangian has some symmetry, can you always perform the renormalization in such a way that it doesn't break the symmetry? Mm -hmm. so, how do you this is a question. Well, technically, the way one investigates, the more subtle and sophisticated the symmetry, the more difficult such a question is to investigate. Um, Technically, the way one would prove it would be to do everything with a cutoff. That is to say, to um, uh, truncate the theory such a way that all divergent integrals become convergent, perhaps just by brutally throwing away the high momentum modes, cutting them out of the theory. Uh, <clears throat> do all the computations that way, and then see what happens. If your cutoff procedure preserves your symmetry, if you're cunning enough to invent a cutoff procedure that preserves the symmetry, there is no problem. On the other hand, um, for uh, things like phi goes into minus phi, or, or psi goes into either the I lambda psi, there's essentially no problem. Just throwing away the high momentum modes will do things. For things like Lorentz invariant, you have to be a little more careful. Throwing away the high momentum modes is not good enough. That's not a Lorentz invariant prescription. And later on, much later in the course, because it's really just a technical matter, I'll talk about such Lorentz invariant cutoff prescriptions. For uh, symmetries like dilatations or the gauge transformations that appear in electrodynamics, things are even more subtle, and you have to be even more cunning. And in some cases, you can't be cunning. There is a formal symmetry, there exists a formal symmetry of the Lagrangian that uh, cannot be realized with any cutoff procedure and one can prove that. And therefore, the equations like the conservation of currents that you would get from that symmetry are, in fact, false equations. So, so the, that situation is called anomalies. So what we had with this I feel, I mean, to justify it, we have to show the... There is a certain prejudice in the terminology. <laughs> <laughs> well, but to justify... Well, you make everything finite by only scaling phi. As you make every, if you just put in the most brutal sort of cutoff, just cut off all your integrals at the high momentum end. Okay? Just stop. Instead of going on to k equals infinity, you stop at some fixed large k. Um, then everything is obviously okay. As far as that doesn't affect uh, symmetries like psi goes into, uh, into uh, e to the i phi psi, etc. Okay? It's not the renormalizations that may spoil the symmetry. If this theory is symmetric, redefining it in terms of new parameters, which is all renormalization does, won't spoil the symmetry. The, the divergent integrals that occur in which renormalization cures may spoil the symmetry. Yes? One part seems, I must admit, circular reasoning to me. You, you, you 
symmetry of renormalized Lagrangian to show that they can't possibly be a term like G. No, I use the symmetry of the unrenormalized Lagrangian to demonstrate that. And then I observe that I need not add a constant of phi to make his vacuum, uh, to a psi, to, uh, to uh, make his vacuum expectation value zero. I use the symmetry of the unrenormalized Lagrangian. The renormalized Lagrangian is, of course, the unrenormalized Lagrangian. They're equal functions. They're just expressed in terms of different sets of parameters. I guess what I'm asking is, could you re-sketch quickly the argument that you used to show the vacuum expectation value of psi? The vacuum expectation value of psi is zero. No, psi. I'll then prove it. That's certainly true. OK. Therefore, if I wish to define psi prime, which is as before, except I call it z2, <laughs> mm. That's not the problem. <laughs> that I can see. The, the problem is this. I mean, it, it seems to me that the reason that, that phi not, doesn't necessarily have zero expectation value is because of the, uh, if there's one phi field, you can get the, the, the possess of the symmetries, even if you had, had a constant Lagrangian, the symmetries are still possessed. It's not the only symmetries Lagrangian has, the trivial Lorentz symmetry and, right. Right. Now, now that's not true of psi. That's right. But I mean, you wanted a, this, this is a proof that the vacuum expectation value of psi prime is zero. <laughs> well, guess, okay, well, then uh, and there's no need for a counter term corresponding to shifting psi. I, I, I think what I must be asking then is why the unrenormalized expectation value has been zero. Oh, well, OK. Be, that's because of charge conservation. There isn't a conserved quantity associated with electric charge. OK. By assumption, the vacuum is unique. That's certainly true in perturbation theory. And therefore, Q vacuum must be, since Q commutes with the Hamiltonian, the, the vacuum must be an eigenstate of Q. Okay. Star. Yeah, and, no, well, just a minute. Q is um, lambda zero by a trivial argument. I mean, you all believe the vacuum contains zero charge, but I'll just demonstrate it for you. <laughs> this is zero because uh, J0 is a fourth component of a vector, and the vacuum is Lorentz invariant, so the expectation value of J0 is zero. Okay. <clears throat> so the vacuum carries zero charge. It's a charge eigenstate with eigenvalue zero. Now we go on, and um, we look at Uh, I guess there's no i here. The i comes into the uh, equal time commutators. OK. Um, <clears throat> we look at <clears throat> this is equal to 0, because each term either has a q on the left hitting the vacuum or a q on the right hitting the vacuum. And therefore, this is 0. The physics of the argument really doesn't need any of these equations. It's physically obvious the vacuum carries zero charge. <laughs> the, uh, this just says that psi is an operator that reduces the charge by minus by one. When it's applied to any state, it reduces the charge by one. Therefore, when applied to the vacuum state, it produces a state of charge minus one, which is a fortiori orthogonal to the vacuum state, which is a state of charge zero. OK, fine. The only last thing I'd say is that it seems to use a similar argument for the meson field. Say that uh, clearly the vacuum is zero mass. Therefore, mm. why should there be any expectation value for? Uh, Try and construct. What's the analog of Q? Another way of seeing it is that there are no diagrams for the vacuum expectation value of psi, because the diagram that would contribute to the vacuum expectation value of psi would be a diagram with one line going in and no lines going out. What's going to happen to that line? <laughs> <laughs> Whereupon it's easy to make a diagram for the vacuum expectation value of phi. Whoops. Yeah, that's right. OK. Other questions? Yes? Uh, last time you said that sigma of q squared in the spectral representation is 
in perturbation theory, zero if q squared is less than the minimum of 4m squared of 4 mu squared. And then you said in exact theory, uh, it's, q, it's, le it's zero if q squared is less than mu squared plus epsilon. Uh, first, OK, I mean, intuitively, those statements seem quite obvious. Mm -hmm. But how would one derive those results? Oh, it's incredibly difficult. Well, in fact, for this theory, for this theory, even the most rigorous mathematician would not be able to derive it because, as I've mentioned several times, this theory is just a model and is not a satisfactory physical theory. For example, it really doesn't have a vacuum because the, cla the energy isn't bounded below. Phi psi star psi can be made as large as you want and given any sign by giving phi an appropriate sign. But you mean in an analogous theory that would be sensible, like lambda phi fourth. Oh, one would have, that's very complicated. I mean, people, that's, you are describing the life work of Arthur Jaffe, the proof <laughs> that, <laughs> to prove, given a Lagrangian theory to prove that it has those obviously desirable properties, that the energy is unbounded below, that the states are, at least for weak coupling, one meson and one nucleon, that the, uh, that the uh, you know, et cetera, that the, the, there are no states of negative energy in the theory, Statements like that are, in general, very difficult to prove. They are certainly not obvious. The, the, of course, we can take the position that if those statements are not true, then the theory is, doesn't describe, isn't a realistic theory. And we can just say, so we hope that somewhere among the batch of theories we are exploring, some of them are realistic, although we don't have the mathematical skill to prove that. And the realistic ones must obey these assumptions. One more question. Why aren't they equal? I mean, why doesn't perturbation theory give the exact result? Well, there may be bound states. You never see bound states That's in any perfect. finite order in perturbation theory. Okay. Well, we, there are various techniques for finding bound states, but uh, uh, there is no, uh, well, even if I had a system of, of uh, non-relativistic particles with arbitrary potentials between them, it's not an easy job mathematically to see whether they have bound states or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in general. There are only a very few cases where it's easy with the exactly soluble systems. Mm -hmm. Usually it's a, you know, it's a 200-page paper with a thousand inequalities in it to show whether or not there are bound states. Uh, those um, states you dealt with last week, which you called N, the many particle states, are they just the state? In, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, optical theorem, the notation I adopted there? Yeah, you're proving that. That's just a complete set of energy eigenstates. Are these are free? No, no, no. Exact energy eigenstates of the exact Hamiltonian. Oh, and the PN is in the exact, exact some of the momenta of all these particles. Some of the momenta, yeah, whatever that state is. Whatever its energy is. And what it, these particles do not have definite masses, either mesons mass or mesons. No, they could be a state of 72 mesons and 42 nucleons. That's just I sum over a complete set of eigenstates but of the energy momentum operator. If PN, you don't just add up a lot of momenta of normal. Yes, well, in fact, you do if the only states are the in and the out states. If you choose either an in or an out state basis, then you just do add them up. Okay, assuming there are no bound states in the theory. If there were bound states in the theory, the in and out states would contain mesons and nucleons and meson nucleon bound states. Okay. But if you use the, but in general, I, I mean, I didn't want, it wasn't necessary in that argument to specify what n was. It's just an eigenstate of the energy momentum operator with eigenvalue p mu of these four commuting operators with eigenvalue p mu. It's, the, it's always the exact Hamiltonian in this part of the analysis. The only time the breakup into the, uh, into the free Hamiltonian and the interacting Hamiltonian enters is when we're specifically doing perturbation calculations. When I'm proving general quantities of some, general properties of something like a Green's function I'm working in the exact Heisenberg picture and using the exact Hamiltonian and its exact energy and momentum eigenstates. Is that clear? Okay. Yes, OK. Um, well, when you were calculating, the, um, when, when you were starting to calculate the meson self energy, um, you wrote down that minus i pi prime was minus i of pi f of t squared minus pi f of t squared minus t squared minus t squared minus pi f. Yes, that's right. Well, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, right. How did you get that? I got that from the equation. 
expressed diagrammatically as it's the sum of this and this. And I don't remember now whether I used a plus or a minus sign in my definition of VAs or Bs. With your permission, let me use a plus sign. Yes, OK. Yeah. That line you understood. Yeah. Now I want to fix B2 and C2 yeah. by the conditions that pi prime of mu squared equals d pi prime dp squared. Well, I'll demonstrate it for you. Okay. B2 equals 0. It's known as a, it's a linear system of equations. B2, okay. I guess there wasn't a mu squared here, I'm sorry. There was just a p squared. So I'll write it as C2 p squared minus mu squared plus mu squared C2. That's how it came out. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Okay. B2 plus mu squared C2 equals minus pi, pi f of mu squared, evaluating this equation at mu squared. Evaluating its first derivative at mu squared, I get c2 equals minus d squared pi f dp squared at mu squared. Uh, oh, no, no, two. That's right. It's a function of p squared. Okay? Yeah. You see how that follows from exerting this expression into these things? I'm too busy writing it down, but I'm going to when I get home and look at Okay, well, then you just plug that back in and you get the expression I put on the board. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> I would worry about I would worry about that if I were you. <laughs> no. The uh the uh the um are there further questions? <laughs> or expression <laughs> Okay. okay, right now. The, um, this lecture will be somewhat um, uh, a smorgasbord. There will be a lot of, diff of little topics which we will take care of. Firstly, I would like to compute my, uh, complete my pi prime computation. Secondly, I would like to give more information in general of how you would tackle either uh, graphs with more lines on a single loop or more loops than one. Then I'll explain systematically how we can do the Feynman trick for them, how we can reduce every, do all the D4K integrals and reduce everything to an integral over parameters. And then I would like to return to our renormalization constant, uh, renormalization program and discuss coupling constant renormalization, the one renormalization we have not discussed in detail yet. Then I will make a few remarks, although hardly go deep into the subject, of whether renormalization always gets rid of infinities or only for certain special theories. And then finally, I will probably, I hope to begin at the end of this lecture, but I probably will not complete it until the end of next lecture, until the middle of, beginning of next lecture, what happens when, in our model theory, we take mu greater than 2m, what goes wrong, and develop a more, a theory of unstable particles that is not dependent on the adiabatic turning on and off prescription as our earlier theory was. Now, the first topic, I will just begin in media race, assuming you are capable of plugging into using our integral table on the parametric integral we had. And uh, we obtain the formula. What did I call the momentum? Q squared or K squared last lecture? My notes were taken from Q squared. The 
external momentum on pi f? P squared? Pi f of p squared equals, from our integral table and the formulas there, g squared over 16 pi squared. We are left with the Feynman integral, 0 to 1 dx, log m squared minus p squared x times 1 minus x uh, minus i epsilon. Plus dot, 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 that dot, dot, dot is the dot, dot, dot from the integral table with some terms that uh, vanish in a convergent combination. And of course, we have a convergent combination. This is just applying the integral table to the parametric form of the integral we had written down. I don't expect you to uh, see in a flash that a 16 pi squared and not some other number, but I hope you know how to, do, how to uh, derive that expression yourself. We can now compute the dot, dot, dots are irrelevant since they vanish in a convergent combination. And um, pi prime of p squared is by pi f of p squared minus pi f of mu squared minus p squared minus mu squared d pi f d p squared evaluated at mu squared. Therefore, we plug this into that and obtain the answer. g squared over 16 pi squared as a universal factor. Everything is parametrically integrated with respect to the Feynman parameter x. The first subtraction simply gives me log m squared minus p squared x 1 minus x minus i epsilon. Subtracting out the pi f of mu squared gives me m squared minus mu squared x 1 minus x. And we will shortly show we need not retain the i epsilon in that factor. And uh, we shouldn't. Pi f of mu squared had better be a real number. Otherwise, something's gone drastically wrong with our computation. <laughs> and uh, finally, minus p squared minus mu squared times the derivative with respect to p squared. Changes the minus sign to a plus. Puts an x1 minus x up here. m squared evaluated at mu squared. mu squared x1 minus x. This ugly expression is our final result for pi prime f to order g squared. It's obtained by sticking this into this. Now, the x integral is, in fact, elementary and can be done with a table. I believe it gives you an inter with uh, Dwight's tables. I believe it gives you an inverse hyperbolic tangent, but don't trust, take my word for it. I leave it for interested parties to do that. I would like to discuss the, uh, as a consistency check on this computation, I would like to discuss the analytic properties of this integral. After all, pi prime is related, linearly related to the inverse of d prime. And therefore, it should have the same analytic properties as, um, as d prime. Except, of course, it doesn't have a pole, where d prime has a pole. It has a 0. And that part is manifest. Therefore, pi prime should be analytic. except for a cut along the positive real axis. I will argue that, I will argue shortly that immediately that in this order of perturbation theory, the cut begins at 4m squared, not at 4mu squared. The argument that it begins at um, 4m, 4m mu squared rather than 4m squared is, uh, sorry, 4m squared rather than 4mu squared just requires looking at a Feynman graph. 
You recall the cut was associated with the function sigma, that is to say with the amplitude for the field to make a, a state out of the vacuum when applied to the vacuum. So if we consider the graph for that will consist of uh, to lowest order, to order G, simply this. The field applied to the vacuum can make a nucleon antinucleon state. On the other hand, to order G, and it's only the order G contribution to this because this thing gets squared, that's the only thing it can make. It doesn't make a nucleon, a, a meson pair until order G cubed. So we won't get contributions from two meson intermediate states in the spectral representation until we reach order G6. They'll be there, but they'll be there in order G6, and we won't see them in order G, cubed, in order G squared. Thus, uh, we expect this to be an analytic function of uh, k squared, aside from a cut beginning at 4m squared as asserted. Is there any question about the argument? Since we're only working to order g squared. Now let's check this out. Any questions? Some people are looking a bit baffled. Okay. <clears throat> Now let's work this out. What, are, what is the analytic property of this thing? Well, obviously it's an analytic function except for the cut in the logarithm, introduced by the cut in the logarithm, which of course survives the cut when we do the x integral. And uh, therefore, all we've got to study is uh, this object up here. I wrote, I'm oh, sorry, this object up here. That is to say, we have to study m squared minus p squared x 1 minus x. Troubles arise if cut comes if this thing is negative or zero, that is to say if we're on the branch line in the logarithm for x in the range of integration. <coughs> now, for if imaginary part of p squared is not equal to 0, then there's obviously no cut, because x times 1 minus x is positive. So this thing has a non-zero imaginary part everywhere throughout the domain of integration, while the boundaries is equal to m squared, and that's not a negative number. So there's no cut there. There's no possible singularities for imaginary part of p squared not equal to 0. If p squared is less than or equal to 0, that is to say along the negative real axis, there's again no problem because this thing is positive. Since it's a sum of a positive number and a positive no difference of a positive number and a negative number. So again, there's no cut. Therefore, the only possible place we have to worry about is p squared real and greater than 0. Now, let's plot this thing. Here's x, here's 0, here's 1. Up here I'll plot m squared minus p squared x times 1 minus x. And this is, of course, a upward pointing, uh, sorry, a, um, a uh, yeah, an upward pointing parabola. The coefficient of x squared is positive. At uh, the origin, it's equal to m squared. At the point 1, it's also equal to m squared. And since it's a parabola, it looks something like this. It obviously attains its minimum value at 1 half. Thus, all we need to compute to check that it is positive throughout the domain of integration is to check that it is positive at the point 1 half. m squared minus p squared 1 half times 1 minus 1 half equals m squared minus p squared over 4. Thus, there is no cut. if p squared is less than 4m squared. 
because then the integrand is again always positive. On the other hand, if p squared is greater than or equal to 4m squared, there's a cut. Because then the integrand goes negative, we have to use the i epsilon in our prescription, and it matters whether we've approached the real p squared axis from above or below. Are there any questions about this analysis? Of course, I should have made a triumphant shout because this is exactly the analyticity properties we had anticipated on general grounds. Okay. These sorts of tricks will be useful to us in the second term where we will investigate um, um, analyticity properties that are considerably more difficult to prove on general grounds but by using this sort of reasoning, considerably sophisticated and automated, we will be able to prove that they are true to every order in perturbation theory. That's not the same as proving things exactly, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> that takes care of the first topic. I now turn to topic two, which is the dull machinery of um, firstly uh, taking, p putting together many denominators in a generalization of Feynman's trick, and secondly doing an integral that may have more than one loop in it. As we will see, there is essentially nothing new. The first thing is putting together many denominators, all the denominators that run along a loop, and of course there may be many of them. For example, if we're just restricting ourselves to a single loop integral, this graph, which we've discussed before, has four denominators along the loop. We, at the moment, we do not know how to do such an integral. We only do know how to do one where there are two denominators running around the loop. The essential formula I will derive is, for, is I will write product on i, 1 over a i plus i epsilon. Those are individual Feynman denominators. The i is the uh, number, if you, if you wish, i goes from 1 to the number of internal lines. I'll call it n, n internal lines along our loop. And each a i is some function of the various moment, external momenta and the loop momentum. I will derive a parametric expression for this. The parametric expression comes from um, two things. Firstly, I can write each of these denominators with no loss as product on i, i, integral from 0 to infinity, d beta i, beta i is a uh, parameter, uh, e to the i, beta i, a i plus i epsilon. The i epsilon ensures that the integral is convergent, and the i in front is needed to cancel out uh, the, uh, the i sticking up here. Now, <clears throat> that's certainly right, and now I will multiply this by something that is obviously 1. Uh, yet another integral, 0 to infinity, d lambda over lambda, delta of 1 minus sum of the beta i's over lambda. By the trivial rules for integrating a delta function, this is 1. We get a lambda squared over the sum of the beta i's from inverting the derivative. Uh, lambda over the sum of the beta i's is 1 because it's a delta function that leaves us with a lambda, which is canceled by this lambda in the denominator. So I hope no one has problems with this formula. We now obtain um, the uh, formula we are after by rescaling and defining alpha i equals beta i over lambda. <clears throat> Thus we have So 1 over a i plus i epsilon equals integral from 0 to infinity 
d lambda over lambda, i to the nth, I'll drag out all those i's, lambda to the nth, integral from 0 to infinity, d alpha 1, d alpha n. Those are what comes from dividing up, from uh, turning uh, d betas into d alphas. Uh, e to the i sum e to the i lambda sum on i alpha i a i plus i epsilon. And finally, delta of 1 minus sum of alpha i. The lambda integral is now trivial. Of course, it was trivial in the other version. The lambda integral is now trivial, so we can do it. <coughs> it gives us the i to the n gets absorbed in to doing the integral. The integral is lambda to the n minus 1, so that's n minus 1 factorial. Integral from 0 to infinity, d alpha 1, d alpha n. <coughs> Delta of 1 minus sum of the alphas, 1 over sum alpha i a i plus i epsilon, whole thing to the nth. <coughs> this is the Feynman formula that tells us how to write a product of Feynman denominators as one big super Feynman denominator with parameters raised to a power. We have the um, alphas are called Feynman parameters. They are the generalizations of the x in our previous formulas. If the generalization is, I hope, obvious to all of you. It looks like it's an integral over n things if I have n denominators. But of course, the delta function makes one of them a trivial integral. And once you perform the uh, delta function to eliminate, um, <coughs> if you call alpha 1x and alpha 2 by doing the delta function integral becomes 1 minus x. And then you just obtain the formula we had on the board last lecture. So this is the generalization for more lines. Uh, please notice it is not clear a priori that this is a uh, good thing to do. It means that any one loop graph, with what we know already, with the aid of our integral table in this, in any one loop graph, which starts out as an integral d4k, can be reduced to an integral essentially over n minus 1 parameters, where n minus 1, where n is the number of lines on the, on the uh, loop. This is obviously a good thing to do if there are f uh, four or fewer lines on the loop. <laughs> it is not clear that it is a good thing to do if there are five or more. <laughs> it is, in fact, a good thing to do, but it's not clear that you are tra to trade an integral d4k for an integral d6 over 16 Feynman parameters. is <laughs> not necessarily a good thing to do. <laughs> Thus, with the aid of this formula in the integral table, you can reduce uh, any graph which only has one loop to an integral over Feynman parameters. OK? And the integral over Feynman parameters, if we could do that in general, we would be very happy people. <laughs> but unfortunately, it doesn't turn out that way. They're usually messy integrals that are not doable, and only doable in terms of elementary functions and simple cases. But uh, And that is why people who do things like the um, uh, sixth order correction to the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron spend a lot of time programming computers. <laughs> I will now discuss how this device can be generalized to graphs with more than one loop.
more lines, and I will now discuss more loops. Then I'll complete the, I will have completed the law of doing Feynman integrals, at least for theories that only involve non-derivative interactions of scalar particles. It turns out for theories, more complicated theories, it's pretty much the same thing, except these integrals have factors in the denominator as well as the numerator when all the dust settles down. Factors in the numerator as well as the denominator, excuse me. For an, as an example, suppose I take five-fourth theory. In this case, the lowest order non-trivial contribution to the meson self-energy would involve a graph that looks like this. Aside from the combinatoric factors, which are a great pain in the neck from five-fourth theory, since you have four identical fields at a vertex, the uh, shape of the integral is clear. If we call the external momentum P, we have two possible loop momentum, one running around the top loop and one running around the bottom loop. And thus, for example, if I call this momentum K, and this momentum, uh, K, say K1, and this momentum K2, the momentum down here is P minus K1 minus K2, all oriented running from right to left, and then P comes out again. And I have an integral D4K1, D4K2. Aside from the combinatoric factors and the factors of I, I have an integral D4K1, D4K2 over K1 squared minus mu squared. I'll suppress the I epsilons, K2 squared minus mu squared, P minus K1 minus K2 quantity squared minus mu squared. So that's the sort of general structure we will get if we have a graph with two loops. I've left out all the constant numerical factors, the g's and the two pi fourths and the i's. Are there any questions about how this is, what you read off from this graph? Now let's consider a general case. Where we have a ki for each independent loop, i in this case goes from 1 to l, we have a bunch of external momenta, qi, external momenta, how many depends on how many external lines there are on the graph, i here of course runs over a totally different range. And we have, um, uh, in general, uh, and internal lines. I will sketch how to do such an integral, that is to say, how to use nothing but our integral table and the Feynman formula on the center of board to reduce it to an integral over Feynman parameters. The first part of the trick is to use the Feynman formula to reduce everything, all the internal lines simultaneously, to one big denominator, as sketched out here. Thus, we arrive at an integral of the following form. The integral we wish to study, again, I will suppress numerical factors. I'll simply write i as the integral we want to study. D4k1 up to D4KL, integral from 0 to infinity, D alpha 1, D alpha n, delta 1 minus the sum of all the alphas, 1 over some enormous denominator, which I will write down to the power n. That's this thing here. And dn is of the following form. D is going to be some quadratic function of the K, since it's uh, in, <clears throat> obtained by combining all the denominators. And every internal momentum is, of course, a linear function of the Ks and the external momentum of the loop momenta and the external momentum, as shown here, where they are K1, K2, and P minus K1 minus K2. So D will be of the following form.
to L, some matrix AIJ, KI dot KJ, plus sum on I, uh, no sum on I, I'm sorry, uh, plus um, some, how should I write it, some, sum on I, that's right, some vectors BI dot KI, like P dot K, as appears in that squaring, plus some constant C. A, as we see from the formula, depends only on the alphas, not on the extra values of the external momenta. The term quadratic in the Ks is independent of what the external momenta is. It, in fact, depends linearly on the alphas. Just whatever happens when you sum up all the denominators using this Feynman formula. Uh, <clears throat> B and C depend on both the alphas and the external momenta, the uh, piece. Okay, is this general form clear? This is inevitably the general form you will get. Yes, sir. Did you do both the delta functions when you wrote down the expression Yeah, sure. I've, I always use the delta fun, get rid of all the things that are determined by overall energy momentum conservation. Okay, so I'm left with just two momenta. The momentum on this line is completely, well, if I assign the momentum this, well, this way, I've obviously satisfied all the constraints of energy momentum conservation. Okay. Is, it, is that clear? Or do you want more details? In general, the number of, Although in the Ur form of the, the original form of the Feynman rules, the primitive form of the Feynman rules, we get um, things that I'm tangled. There we go. We get things that um, uh, involve a uh, energy momentum, a independent integration momentum for each internal line, and an energy momentum conserving delta function for each vertex. Most of the delta functions are doable trivially. Indeed, all but one of them for a connected graph are doable trivially. One is left over for energy momentum conservation. And thus, we are left only with an integration variable for each loop. Okay. Just to make sure I haven't made a mistake, let's see. Here we would a priori have three internal momenta to integrate over. We have two delta functions. One of them gets thrown away because it's the overall delta function that's factored out. So we have three minus one non-trivial integration variables equals two. Okay? Now, <coughs> an interesting fact about A, which we'll use, is that A is a positive matrix. It, after all, is a sum of squares multiplied by these alphas, which are positive parameters. So A is a positive matrix. Its eigenvalues are all positive or zero. And in fact, it's positive definite, except perhaps when some alphas vanish. I mean, in most of the range of integration, it's, it's actually really positive, positive definite, except if some alphas vanish, uh, maybe on the boundaries of the range of integration. For example, at the point where all the alphas are zero, which is, in fact, not in the domain of integration because of the delta function, <laughs> that's a good example, it's zero, which is not positive definite. <laughs> OK, now we go. With this sort of integral, we can shift, in general, that is to say, we can define ki prime equals ki plus sum on j, A inverse, the inverse matrix, ij, kj. Oh, whoops. No, bj. Excuse me. 
Uh, that's certainly our freedom to do that. I guess I should have a one half in here, shouldn't I? And then we uh, have our denominator revealed as sum on i and j, a i j, k i prime, k j prime. The cross term uh, cancels. The cross term is rather produced by this formula, a inverse a b. <laughs> and um, we are left over with a new constant, which I'll call C prime. That's the definition of C prime. We're just doing, in general, what we did for the one loop integral. We've eliminated all the terms linear in the loop momentum in the denominator by defining new integration variables, which are shifted versions of our old one. <coughs> now we can go further. Um, let, let me look at my thing to see how I've gone further. Yes. Aij is a symmetric matrix, and therefore we can diagonalize it. Therefore, let us diagonalize Aij. You might think this will be the hard part of the computation, to diagonalize Aij, but you'll see that the really doesn't matter how we diagonalize Aij. <laughs> so we diagonalize Aij. And we introduce, therefore, new integration variables, ki double prime, that are linear combinations of the ki's corresponding to the eigenvalues of aij. Since aij is a symmetric matrix, uh, the integral is uh, just as good in the ki double primes as it is in the ki's. The diagonalization is an orthogonal transformation that doesn't affect this. So I have my integral then becomes i equals integral d4 k1 double prime, d4 kl double prime, integral from 0 to infinity, d alpha 1, d alpha n, delta of 1 minus some on i alpha i. One over sum on i, a quantity I'll call a i, k i double prime squared, that's just the diagonal entries, plus this is good old c prime. That doesn't get changed, that's just a constant. Dep a constant it depends on the external momentums and the alphas in a complicated way, but it's a constant. A i's are the eigenvector values. Now we can go further, and we can define ki triple prime equals, the ai's are of course positive, except there may be some places where they uh, vanish at the boundaries of the integration. Oh, thank you, to the nth power. Yes, it would be, uh, I would have turned a convergent integral into a divergent one. ki double prime, rescaling the k's. Thus we find our integral becomes, <coughs> it's actually sort of cute, although it's a pain in the neck after, after this stage. We, our integral becomes um, one, there are four of them, so I have product on i, uh, one over square root of ai to the fourth, because there are four of those things. The integral, d4 k1 triple prime, d4 kl triple prime, integral from zero to infinity, d alpha one, d alpha n, delta of one minus sum of the alphas, one <coughs> over sum on i, ki triple prime squared plus c prime to the nth. Oh, they're in the integral. You're quite right. Thank you. Now, 
As I say, we didn't have to worry about diagonalizing the matrix because the product of the eigenvalues is just the determinant of the matrix. So this whole expression here is in fact simply 1 over determinant A, I, determinant AIJ, quantity squared. So you don't actually have to go through the diagonalization. You just have to be able to compute the determinant. <laughs> C prime you knew before you ever diagonalized the matrix. And uh, then you just have to compute its determinant. That's the only relevant part. We now have the situation in the shape where we can systematically do all of the ki double prime, triple prime integrals, one right after another, just using our integral table. Whenever we do one of them, we'll knock n down by 2 and prick up a horrendous numerical factor. And we'll just keep on going until we do them all. So we can always, by this, this algorithm, which I have sketched out, we can systematically reduce any integration, any Feynman graph, providing always, of course, that it is a convergent graph or arises in a convergent combination of graphs. We can systematically reduce any Feynman graph into an integration over Feynman parameters equal in number to the number of internal lines. Thus, for example, for the graph I sketched out, This would be an eight-dimensional integral in the first instance, d4k1, d4k2. We reduce it to a, by this prescription to a three-dimensional integral over three Feynman parameters. And one of those is trivial because of the delta function. OK, it's uh, not the world's most exciting subject, but if you were ever confronted with the problem of computing a graph like this, you will be happy that I have gone through this. <laughs> Okay. So all you need to know once you've got this trick, which I mean you don't have to, it doesn't have any numeric, I've, I've arranged it so there are no numerical factors to memorize, just a procedure to understand, which you can work out afresh for every particular instance. Once you have this trick, you have the Feynman formula that tells you how to combine the denominators, and you have the Xerox integral table, which I passed out. In principle, you can reduce any Feynman graph to an integral over Feynman parameters. At that point, typically you're stuck. But or you go to the computer. OK. <clears throat> yeah. Could you explain the analogy of this for the electrical circuit? It exists, yeah. Yeah, that's the, there's an easy trick for computing C prime, if you want to, that uses the electrical circuit analogy. And that just comes from realizing that what you're really doing is shifting to the minimum of this quadratic form, OK? So you want to ask, what is, uh, how do you compute the minimum of this quadratic form? You want to find the, the point you're shifting to is the point where the quadratic form is at a minimum as a function of the k's. Which, which the quadratic form? D, D, as a function of the k's. Okay. So what you're really looking at is C prime is uh, the value of D at its minimum, at a stationary point, which is defined by say at Ki equals Ki bar. OK. And then C prime equals D evaluated at K, K1 bar to Kn bar, uh, Kl bar. OK? Now, um, this can be thought of as an electrical circuit problem. Because if I ask what happens if I differentiate with respect to any loop momentum in this expression, OK? Remember the structure of D. Each loop momentum, if I go around the loop like this, I'm sorry, to explain this, I'll have to introduce a new notation. I've already called k's the loop momentums, q's, p's the momentum on the internal lines, which are linear functions. In which case, D is sum on I, alpha I, PI. Oh, I called P's the external momentum. Sorry, Q's. QI squared. Q was the external? OK. P's. 
Okay. If we go around the given loop and integrate with respect to the loop momentum with an infinitesimal change in the loop momentum, the P is up, PIs that are on that loop get changed by one or minus one, depending upon which way it's running, and the other ones don't get that aren't on the loop don't get changed at all. So this condition boils down to some around every closed loop sum of alpha i pi bar equals zero, where pi bar is the values the pi's assume when the loop momenta are ki bar. Who asked that question? Okay, are you following so far? Other people needn't follow. We just <laughs> this is like this is like Kirchhoff's laws. Okay, if we think of the pi's component by component as being currents flowing through this graph, the conservation of energy momentum on every vertex is the statement that current is conserved at every vertex. And this is a statement, if we interpret alpha i as a resistance, that uh, the voltage drop around every closed loop is zero. OK? And then we see what C prime is. C prime is um, uh, the um, uh, power in the circuit. <laughs> OK? Uh, times uh, two, I guess. It's twice the power in the circuit in the Kirchhoffian configuration because uh, summed, of course, over, there are actually four virtual circuits, one for each component of I, and there are some minus signs floating around, but it's essentially the power in the circuit. It's the sum of one half R I squared. No, R or one over R? Alpha is one over R. Hmm? No, I R, V is I R. <laughs> I squared, <laughs> I squared R is the power. So this is simply the power, and each of these four things is, a, is, is uh, algebraically related to the power floating in the circuit. Okay. So uh, you can, uh, the techniques for, well, but it all boils. This is not here. If you have had the kind of education where you do play with complicated circuits a lot, you might find it useful. I have not, so I do not. <laughs> so why did you require um, because uh, that defines the minimum. We're shifting to the minimum of the point k prime equals zero is the minimum of this uh, of this of d. So the idea is that after you shift it, mm -hmm. then it looks like this. Mm -hmm. No, what the, the condition, the, k, the, the constant you add is the constant you would get it comes from this equation, which is the dd, <laughs> the, uh, the loop momentum equals zero. Oh, okay. I mean, don't, I, I didn't want to teach this. Someone, I was forced into it. Someone asked the question. Yeah. I may not even get to, pro, to the fourth topic I wanted to discuss, renormalization versus infinities, let alone the fifth. Um, oh, by the way, before I forget, there is a new homework problem set, which is here. Now, I would like to briefly discuss the uh, condition that will determine our final renormalization constant. Remember, we were going through the renormalization program for this theory, the silly theory, and we, haven't, uh, we had left one thing fixed, the uh, condition that determines the physical value of G, which was a matter to be decided by a UPEP committee, and which would eventually fix <coughs> The last term in our A, B, C, D, E, F, yes. <laughs> our last renormalization constant, F. I will first state the definition, then show you how it works in fixing F iteratively, and then finally explain how it could be connected with a physically doable experiment, because I will define it in what, is in princi what looks at first glance like a totally unphysical object. Well, to determine A, we studied the one-point Green's function. To determine B, C, D, and E, we studied the two-point Green's function. So it's pretty obvious that to study F, we have to study a three-point Green's function with one psi, one psi star, and one phi. I will define this object with momentums assigned P, P prime, and Q to be minus i gamma prime. 
is, of course, a Lorentz invariant function. Since the three momenta are arranged so that p plus p prime plus q equals 0, is a function really of only two independent vectors, which can be thought of as p and p prime. And therefore, it is a function of three inner products, p squared, p prime squared, and p dot p prime. Actually, it would be more, be more convenient for us to write as a function of the three inner products, p squared, p prime squared, and q squared. q squared is trivially re linearly related to p dot p prime and the other two. <coughs> To um, up to third order in perturbation theory, it's easy to see there are only a very few graphs that contribute to this thing. For example, equals, there's uh, this graph, which occurs in first order, of course, plus um, here's a genuine monster of a third order graph. That is, in fact, one of your homework problems <laughs> to check the algorithms on, if you understood the algorithms on doing integrals, you'll be computing this. And finally, in third order, there may be the counter term, evaluated, of course, only to third order in perturbation theory. Uh, the condition I will impose to define the renormalized coupling constant is this. <coughs> Gamma prime at m squared, m squared, and mu squared, that one particular point where all three lines are on the mass shell, a point that cannot, by the way, be attained by any physical scattering process if the meson is stable, but we might, which we might hope to reach by analytic continuation, equals g. This is the definition of what the physical g is. This is a totally arbitrary definition at this moment. It is the one we choose to adopt for reasons I will explain shortly. By the way, to, as I said, to adopt such a definition, we have to be, really, I should have first gone through a low, whole song and dance to show that gamma prime was real at that point, so I could use that definition. It turns out, in fact, you can prove that you can always analytically continue to that point, and gamma prime is real at that point. You will check that in third order in this homework problem. The, <clears throat> this condition, if I adopt it, in the usual way, just as in all, the, I won't go through the song and dance once more, iteratively determines E order by order in perturbation theory. In this thing, it means that since this thing is already G, the sum of these two graphs must cancel at P squared equals P prime squared equals mu squared, which determines E3. F, that I, I wrote E, oh, that's unfortunately an easy thing, F. <laughs> Uh, that determines, iteratively determines F. It iteratively determines the coupling constant renormalization counter term in exactly the same way as before and completes our specification of renormalization conditions. Now, <clears throat> in principle, since the definition of the coupling constant is completely arbitrary, anything that gives G to lowest order is as good as anything else as far as anyone is concerned. That, that one condition I want to preserve so I can iteratively determine F. But aside from that, any old p square, m squared, m squared, mu squared, 7m squared, m squared over 14, mu squared over pi, <laughs> who cares on this level? It's just a matter of reparameterizing the theory, defining a different UPAP committee, the UPAP schism, <laughs> that <laughs> defines it differently. Still, it is worth um, devoting a few minutes to explaining why this particular definition is useful and is therefore used by many workers in the field. Well, not for this theory, because people don't work much on this theory, which is silly, but the corresponding one in other theory. The point is this. I'll show <coughs> that this thing, actually I'll show a square, is a physically observable quantity if you do the right experiments. Actually, I'll show a square is a physically observable quantity. That's all we could hope for, because we can arbitrarily change the sign of g just by changing the sign of phi. <laughs> So we can't hope to measure more 
redefining the sine of phi. So we can't hope to, to measure more than the square of g. The, um, consider the process of meson nucleon scattering. Everything on the mass shell. I'd like to divide the graphs that contribute to this into two classes. Those that can be cut in two in this way, not in an arbitrary way. This is an IPI. I'm just cutting it in two this way. So that there's a single meson line, a single nucleon line sticking out in the middle, and everything else. I can certainly divide up my graphs that way. That's my privilege. Now, all of these graphs we know will have a pole in them at S, where S is the center of mass energy for the meson nucleon system equals m squared. Because here's the propagator leering at us from the middle of the graph. As S goes to m squared, they will insert, certainly have a pole. These graphs we don't know anything about. However, it seems plausible that they will not have a pole. How can they have a pole if they don't have a propagator running across? So they've got two particles running across, or three particles running across, we'll be integrating over those propagators, and we'll get not poles, but cuts. So I make a guess, which happens to be true. I will guess, or ask you to take on trust, that only these graphs and these are analytic at s equals m squared, although they may have terrible singularities someplace else. Okay, That's a flat assertion. We know that these have poles at s equals m squared, that only these have poles at s equals m squared. It's just a flat assertion I'm asking you to swallow. Now, we can, of course, sum up all the graphs of this kind Every graph of this kind, it is easy to see, can be written as follows. I keep writing i when I should write one. One particle irreducible. The full propagator. One particle irreducible. Why is this so? Well, this external line this is an S matrix element, so it doesn't get any decorations on it. So it's obviously one particle irreducible when you cut this line. Likewise, this line. This line in the middle can be decorated as much as we please. So we decorate it in every possible way, and then we go on to the, <laughs> to the next vertex. Now, what is that these have a pole at S equals mu squared, m squared. What is the residue of that pole? Well, we happen to know it. We know it because the thing in the middle is the renormalized propagator, which is one i minus, which is i over s minus m squared. The thing on the right is minus i gamma prime. And to find the residue at the pole, we have to evaluate. This line is always on the mass shell. This line is always on the mass shell. And this line is on the mass shell because we're interested in the residue at the pole. So this thing is simply minus ig minus ig on this side by our definition of g, plus everything else, which is, by assumption, analytic near s equals m squared. There's a pole. We've isolated out the pole and extracted this residue. And then every, yes? Like, I'm confused if I mean that they are in this something. What did you say that they do the IBM together or equal to? This is minus ig at the pole, because this line is on the mass shell. 
This line is on the mass shell, and this line is on the mass shell because we're at the pole. Yes, this is the same thing as this. This is the sum of all of this thing summed over anything and anything else. Okay. Now, thus, we know how to determine G, or more properly, G squared, physically. We look at meson nucleon scattering. It is some function of S, and of course also the momentum transfer. We fix, we extrapolate an S below threshold, which we could do numerically or in principle by an analytic continuation, to the point S equals M squared. We find a pole there. We've got to find a pole there. We've shown it. We find a pole there at S equals M squared. We look at the residue of the pole, and that is G squared, aside from a factor of minus I. So that's how we physically define G. Why did I say meson nucleon scattering and not, for example, nucleon nucleon scattering? No reason in the world. I could run through exactly the same reasoning for nucleon nucleon scattering, and I will now do it. I do exactly the same thing for the meson pole that we know from lowest order occurs in nucleon-nucleon scattering, the T-channel pole. By exactly the same reasoning, with S replacing T, I get minus Ig minus ig, i over not now s minus m squared, but t minus mu squared, because this is the renormalized meson propagator, which has a pole at mu squared with residue 1, plus analytic, near t equals mu squared, hopefully. I hope. So I could just as well say, do nucleon-nucleon scattering. Look at the extrapolation to uh, the pole at t equals mu squared, which of course uh, outside the physical region, in the physically accessible scattering region, t runs from 0 to some number depending on the energy. But extrapolate to the pole at t equals mu squared, and then again you'll compute g. Notice these are two completely different experiments. It's not that they're related by crossing or anything. There's no way you can cross meson-nucleon scattering into nucleon-nucleon scattering. You can't, okay? It's two different extrapolation procedures for two and com apparently completely different experiments. And we have asserted that the two of them, when you do the same, when you massage them in the same way, in di two different ways, will end up giving you the same number. Now, no one has done this in nature because there are no scalar particles with these kinds of interactions in nature, but they have studied the pion nucleon system for the real pion and the real nucleon, which is similar in its combinatoric structure, although there are lots of Dirac matrices floating around at the vertices. I will tell you what happened. <laughs> Chu and Lo, I should also emphasize this is not a perturbation theory result, although we have obtained it in the context of perturbation theory. This is true to all orders this whole summed up theory. Chu and Lo analyzed pi on nucleon scattering in the forward direction where the best experiment was, analytically continued to the nucleon pole that exists in pi on nucleon scattering, and computed G. They got it to within 2 or 3% because of the experimental inaccuracies. As I recall, for this system, G is 13.7, so you don't want to use perturbation theory. Okay. Several years later, Mike Moravchik said, gee, there's a lot of data on nucleon-nucleon scattering. Wouldn't it be nice if we could extract out the effect of the pi on pole? Well, he said, if this is true, and he knew, in fact, he knew it was true since he knew a bit more than, than you do at the moment. If this is true, <laughs> the longest range part of the force, the Yukawa potential with range pi on mass, should come just from this pole. All the rest of the stuff will give us shorter range forces. There'll be cuts in T beginning someplace else and will give us shorter range potentials. So the longest range part of the force should be due to the, um, to the pion exchange, which I presume I know. 
Okay, he said, therefore, we'll work in the following way. There's these tremendous phase shift tables on nucleon-nucleon scattering. They've done all sorts of analysis. We'll make the first five or six phase shifts completely free parameters. From what we know in non-relativistic scattering, that should take care of the short-range part of the potential whatever it is at low energies. Then the remaining phase shifts I'll just look at, and I'll t or the remaining scattering data I'll attempt to fit with the Born approximation to this thing. Why the Born approximation? Because when you go out to large phase shifts, you're very far from the potential. So even if the coefficient up in the center of the potential, so even if the coefficient in front of the Ukawa is large, it's still a weak force insofar as it affects the large phase shifts. So we said with g and the pi on mass as free parameters. Okay, so the scheme was, he says, I will fit pi on low energy pi on nucleon scattering with arbitrary phase shifts for the first five partial waves or whatever. Maybe it was the first four. The higher ones I will attempt to fit with the Born approximation with the coupling constant and the pi on mass as free parameters. And lo and behold, the pi on mass came out. The best fit pi on mass was somewhere between 135 and 140 MeV, <laughs> the real pi on mass. And the best fit coupling constant was, as I recall, to within 5 or 10 percent. The experimental errors were a little worse for the system within 5 and 10 percent of that found by Chu and Lo for looking at a completely different system. So it works, OK? It's <laughs> it experiment empirically is checked, this whole routine. That takes care of topic three, coupling constant renormalization. You now know how to compute an arbitrary graph, including the effects of all the renormalization counter terms in our model theory, in principle, or at least reduce it to an integral over Feynman parameters. <coughs> now, <coughs> the last topic, I won't get to unstable particles until next time. The last topic I want to discuss is a few brief remarks about renormalization versus infinities. That was topic four announced at the beginning of the lecture. We have seen, are there questions on this, by the way? Um, we have seen that um, the, um, um, in our theory, in the low order graphs we have looked at, the renormalization constants eat the infinities. In fact, we have more renormalization constants than we need to eat the infinities that occur in this theory. For example, we have a coupling constant renormalization. Yep. The graph it comes with is, of course, not a divergent graph. It's a d fourth k over k to the sixth at high k, because there are three denominators around the loop. And uh, therefore, the, uh, the uh, coupling constant is renormalization, although required to get these beautiful results to give us an observable quantity, observable in two different ways, is not needed, at least at the level we have gone to, to eat the infinities. Let's look at a few low order graphs for a somewhat more complicated theory with somewhat more things at each vertex and see, just make crude estimates to see if the renormalization constants we have will eat the infinities or not. As a first example, let me take a free field, scalar field, single fa scalar field, interacting with itself due to a quartic interaction. I've already written down several graphs in that theory. Now, this theory is much more divergent in low orders than the theory we've talked about. For example, in order g naught squared, we get this graph, which I wrote down before, the so-called lip graph. And this graph is uh, quadratically divergent, not just logarithmically divergent. It is uh, because <coughs> you have two integration momentum. So you have d4k1, d4k2 in the numerator, which is 8 powers of k and only six powers of k in the denominator from your three propagators. So this graph is not logarithmically divergent, like our pi f graph, but quadratically divergent. Fortunately, in this theory, we have more counterterms than we needed. As you recall, when we were doing the cubic interaction theory, 
All we needed was the mass renormalization counterterm to make things finite. From the viewpoint of making things finite, the additional subtraction caused by the wave function renormalization counterterm was not needed. It is an easy check in this theory, <coughs> which you can do on the back of an envelope. Time is running on, so I won't do it for you. That in this theory, both renormalization counterterms are needed in order to render things finite, but they are sufficient to render things finite. The first subtraction turned, in our case, turned a logarithmically divergent integral into a, uh, into a convergent integral. Here what happens is that the first subtraction turns a logarithmic divergence into a, uh, turns the quadratic divergence into a logarithmic divergence, and the second subtraction turns a quad the logarithmic divergence into a convergent integral. <coughs> Another way of saying it is that really all we need to know is the second derivative of this graph with respect to p squared since its value and its first derivative at the renormalization point are fixed. And when we differentiate, every time we differentiate with respect to p squared, we put an extra power of the loop momentum in the denominator. And you do it twice, and you've made it convergent. We also have, to the same order, order g naught squared, a <coughs> a, a coupling con a correction to the four point function which of course will be canceled that's only logarithmically divergent that's the same integral as before that's only logarithm plus cross versions of it and that's of course canceled by the coupling constant renormalization counter term which one introduces in this theory in some way that just makes a single subtraction and it treats it just like pi and makes everything finite is this clear to everyone? I did it fast because the hour is late, but if I'm losing you, stop and ask questions. What are the two renormalization constants? Uh, <coughs> well, B phi squared, there's no uh, plus C d mu phi squared. The mass and wave function renormalization coupling constants, and here there'll be an analog of our F term which, of course, will multiply 5 fourths because the original coupling constant multiplies 5 fourths. Now, things look pretty good, but they also look like we're approaching some sort of boundary. <laughs> what happens if I had fifth. <laughs> well, here are things are going to go blow up in our faces, and I can show them blowing up in our faces by looking at the simple one loop graph, which you all know how to do because you did it. <laughs> We've just got different assignments. In particular, in second order in G naught in this theory, there are five phi's at a vertex. Here is a graph that is obviously logarithmically divergent. Five phi's at each vertex. Okay, it's obviously logarithmically divergent. It's our good old d4k over k fourth integral. Now there ain't no counter term to cancel that. There's no subtraction. To cancel that, we'd need an object that ain't there. It's hard to draw with an x on top of it. A phi six counter term. There's no phi six term in our original Lagrangian. We're stuck. This theory, even on the lowest level, renormalization does not eliminate the infinities. Someone says, OK, wise guy, I guessed the wrong theory. That theory is I, you agree, I agree, it's no good. But I'll put in a phi 6 term. Ha ha. Then you've got, then you've got a phi 6 counter term that cancels that divergence. That's right. <laughs> but you've also got <laughs> this fellow arising to order h squared, which would also, of course, a cross term between this and this <laughs> arising to order h squared, which would require Seven factorial, if I'm going to keep the standard definitions for these things, phi to the eighth to cancel it. Oh, well, then I guess I need a phi to the seventh and a phi to the eighth interaction, too, huh? But then you get 
uh, 16 or 14 or 12, I don't know. It just keeps going up and up. It is an unending escalation of ambiguities. <laughs> In order to cancel all of the divergences that arise generated by this teeny little phi-fifth term, you need to add a phi-sixth term. To cancel the divergences that come from the phi-sixth term, you have to introduce a phi-seventh and a phi-eighth term. To cancel the divergences due to the phi-seventh and phi-eighth term, you need a phi-ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, and fourteenth. And so on. Uh, no, just 12. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. <laughs> Seth? What does that involve a finite number uh, of additional terms? Are there such theories? Well, it looks like five fourths is as far as you can go, huh? Right. The, the, this theory, let me finish saying it and then you'll ask your question. This theory, as soon as we introduce the five fifths, it's like the bite of the apple, the whole thing collapses. The only way, even on the one loop level, of making everything finite, and eliminating all the divergences is to have an infinite string of coupling constants. That is to say, a theory with an infinite number of free parameters in it, which is a terrible thing to try to fit to experiment. <laughs> These theories that cannot be made finite without introducing an infinite number of counter terms are called non-renormalizable. Is, is there no way to have an infinite string where the nth term is balanced by the nth plus something term? So Not in the way we're doing it, maybe by going beyond perturbation theory. I'll answer that question later also, okay? Let me finish saying what I want to say. Theories that are not non-renormalizable are called renormalizable, where you only need a finite number of, <laughs> count of interactions to get a finite theory. We have not shown that theories with only four particle, uh, four field and five, three field interactions are renormalizable. We've just shown that nothing goes wrong on low orders. It's a complicated theorem, which I will talk a lot more about later to show that they are in fact renormalizable. They are, but I'd like to postpone discussing that until we can discuss uh, fermions, which are, uh, and, and do everything at once. Now, but one thing we know, at least from the viewpoint of perturbation theory, as soon as we introduce a little bit of five-fifth, everything goes crazy. Notice the, the infinities make the situation drastically more constrained than in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. In um, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you describe your dynamical degrees of freedom. I have 14 particles. And then you can write down the interactions between them pretty much as you please. Two body forces, three body forces, four body forces, Nothing goes wrong with any of those things as long as they aren't too pathological. You have a lot of free functions. Here it's not so. If I have a single phi field, I can have a cubic term and I can have a quartic term. And that's it. Anything else, the whole thing goes bananas. Now, whether that is because of our ignorance or whether such theories are really and truly sick and nonsensical, at this time no man knows. Now, are there any questions? People, yes, sir. We're connected together in some way. <coughs> nobody knows how to do that. It is a possibility, but nobody knows how to do that. Nobody knows how to set up a, uh, a, a rule of that kind that is uh, in any way sensible. Okay. It is uh, that. That is to say, you want some sort of conditions between the coupling constants, that they're the successive terms in the expansion of a Bessel function. <laughs> and you want your renormalization counter terms, although they'd be infinite in number, just uh, to be uh, made by the, uh, uh, induced by rescaling the parameters that characterize the Bessel function. Okay, that's the idea, right? That's the idea you're suggesting. Nobody knows how to do that. There are no known examples where that works. Okay, that could be, you might say it's a Bessel function, it's cosine of some single coupling constant times phi. That's the interaction. And although you've got phi squared, phi fourth, phi fifth, phi sixth, phi eighth counter terms, they, all the infinities in them come together in such a way so that they're just changing the thing in the cosine. Okay? They're all generated by a single change of a single parameter, a single redefinition of a single parameter. <clears throat> that is certainly not possible. It is certainly not possible within the context of perturbation theory. You can prove that. Whether it is possible in a non-perturbative context, nobody knows. In a non-perturbative context, maybe phi six is okay. 
my own belief because of what uh, the constructive field theorists, uh, Arthur Jaffe and Conrad Osterwalder and their friends, have not yet reached real four-dimensional theories where the divergent structure, as we have seen, is quite horrible. But they have been able to analyze scalar field theories in two and three dimensions. Um, in two and three dimensions, the divergent structure is more moderate because although the propagators are still 1 over k squared, the integration variables are just d squared k and d cubed k, so everything is much more convergent. For every theory they have analyzed, they have shown, and as you would expect, perturbation theory is by no means exact. It is an asymptotic expansion for a small coupling constant, but not convergent, just as a non-relativistic potential scattering. So perturbation theory is not uh, exactly trustworthy in that sense. But the theories do require infinite counterterms, and the structure of infinities in every example they have looked at is exactly the same as the structure of infinities you would guess by looking at perturbation theory. Okay, there's no case in which they cancel. Since they haven't looked at four dimensions, can't say. Maybe it happens in four dimensions. You know, we've got to wait a decade or something until that program reaches four <laughs> dimensions. That's a hard problem. But at the moment, um, I, if I were, I would prefer to maintain an agnostic position, but if under threat of torture I was asked to say yes or no, do non-renormalizable theories make sense, I would say my guess is they do not make sense. Yes? In two dimensions, can those come together the way you said? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. For example, in two dimensions, they do for the theory defined by cosine beta phi. Why doesn't burn happen in, I mean, for example, with the same abundance hmm? in higher dimensions? Oh, it's just a matter of the combinatoric factors. Uh, it's, it's the question of the way these factorials play together. If you assume there's any relationship between these things, say that they are power series and a single small parameter, Okay, you get into uh, you get into trouble. The orders don't come out right. If you say, look at cosine beta phi, it just doesn't work that way. And so, so these are flukes of two dimensions. Insofar as we know, these are flukes of two dimensions. Yes, the divergent structure in two dimensions is incredibly simple, since every propagator gives you a one over k squared, and every loop only gives you a d squared k. The only graphs that are divergent are those which have a single line on each loop. Otherwise, they're convergent. So thus, for example, in a two-dimensional theory, this graph would be divergent. But this graph, our disgusting friend, is convergent. It's d squared k over k to the fourth. So in two dimensions, it's really simple. It's essentially, we can get rid of all the divergences just by normal ordering the interaction, which cancels out these graphs. But in more than two dimensions, it gets much more complicated. In three dimensions, you've already, in two dimensions, anything goes. Phi the nth is fine. Cosine phi is fine. Either my, cosh phi is fine. <laughs> in, um, cosh phi has been proven to exist in the rigorous mathematical sense. In three dimensions, the only, you go up to phi the sixth, and then you come to a screeching halt. And in four dimensions, as I say, you go up to phi the fourth and come to a screeching halt. But you mentioned you're even marking the cos beta phi not only is it normalizable, but it only is normalizable. Yes. Does that happen for cosh? Yes, it also happens for cosh, but it doesn't happen, for example, for uh, a Bessel function or something like that. Don't forget the homework problem.